Chapter Nineteen of the Boy Scouts Through the Big Timber. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Shasta, Oakland, California. The Boy Scouts Through the Big Timber by Herbert Carter. Chapter Nineteen Another Shock. He was a bustard, just as you said, Alan, Giraffe remarked uneasily after they had examined the imprint of those feet, showing the marks of the long, cruel claws. A grizzly, I reckon, Step Hen ventured. Yes, and I think he must have been hurt some, because he seemed to drag his left hind leg a little. Perhaps Bumpus plugged him, Giraffe suggested, just as though he were speaking of some celebrated forest ranger, accustomed to meeting up with these terrors of the Rockies, rather than a fat scout who up to recently had been looked upon by most of his comrades as something of a joke. No, Bumpus was some distance away right here, Alan continued. There's no sign of blood, so we know from that the injury was not a fresh one. And besides, whoever heard of a full-grown grizzly running away from a dozen human enemies after being shot and wounded, much less from a single foe, and he a boy? You're right, Alan commented the scoutmaster. Reckon it does look that way, Giraffe admitted. There was one good trait about the tall scout, no matter how strong an opinion he might have on any subject. Once convinced of the error of his thinking, and Giraffe would own up to his mistake most cheerfully. So, right here, Step Hen broke in, Bumpus was on the run, a chasin' fast after that limpin' grizzly. Say, Giraffe, he was in your class of cripples, because Alan says it was his left hind leg that was hurt. Well, I ain't got but one left leg, so that makes all the difference, the tall scout hastened to announce. I wonder, began Step Hen, and then paused as though hardly daring to frame his thoughts in words. "'We're all doing that,' remarked Alan. "'How did it end?' Thad remarked, straining his eyes to look ahead. "'Say, wouldn't it be just great now,' Giraffe broke out with, "'if we'd just come up with Bumpus a squatting in the crotch of a tree, "'all his ammunition fired away, and that old bear, sittin on his haunches below a waitin for him to come down i'd like to see it said step hen making a suggestive gesture with his gun i'd try to drive a few dum dum bullets into his hulkin old carcass but perhaps bumpus mightn't be so smart about gettin up in a tree when a wounded bear was charging him giraffe ventured to remark all of them had a painful recollection of that other episode when Bumpus rashly discharged his ten-bore marlin at the monster and would have been caught trying to climb a tree only for the help he received from one of his comrades. But Bumpus doesn't make the same mistake twice, I notice, said Thad firmly. And if he fired at this bear, I'm pretty sure he first of all had a tree picked out that he could climb all right. I warrant you he did, Thad, Giraffe added. They were all of them only too eager to believe the best. The very thought of Bumpus, after all the good work he had been doing, meeting such a dreadful fate as being torn to pieces by a bear, was something they tried to banish from their minds as incredible. Nevertheless, in spite of all this 
outward display of confidence they continued to cast eager glances ahead as they pushed on giraffe about this time remembered that there were others also interested in the fate of the lone scout i see hank and pierre are keeping right along he remarked yes replied allan thinking this was really a question maybe they think a nice bearskin wouldn't be a bad article to have even if it is the off-season for furs giraffe added more'n likely step hen broke in with they reckon as how they'd better keep along so as to bury what's left of our poor chum and claim his rifle and other belongings as salvage let's hope then they'll meet up with the greatest disappointment of their lives thad hastened to remark shivering at the cruel picture the words of step hen presented to his mind listen they all came to a standfill when giraffe called out every year was strained in the attempt to catch a sound that might be a cry for help or the distant report of a gun guess it must have been that old crow calling himself hoarse over yonder in that tree giraffe finally admitted thought it was somebody calling us to halt sure i did thad seems like you were mistaken was all the scoutmaster remarked as once again the march was resumed perhaps he didn't overtake the old bear after all step hen broke out with a couple minutes later well he was following the trail all right when he got here allan asserted with a positive way that seemed convincing but you said at first he saw the bear when he took to running i thought he did replied the trail hunter but since then i've come to the conclusion i was wrong still you can see that he kept on for bear bumpus and the two men are written in the tracks as plain as print yes that's so allan but there don't seem to be any sign of life ahead here what's the matter with you old eagle eye just look beyond and see if you can discover our brave chum up in a tree somewhere thus appealed to and complimented rather than otherwise by the title which step hen had thrust upon him giraffe did stretch his long neck and scan the region ahead don't see him waving to us up in one of those trees the other asked nixie returned the one with the keen vision a shade of disappointment perceptible in his voice i can see heaps of trees and perhaps there might be a boy sittin up in one of the same but if he's waving to us i don't get on to his wave but hold on oh then you do see something cried step hen pulling back the hammer of his repeating rifle eagerly not in a tree replied giraffe cautiously something in his manner perhaps in his paling face as well gave thad a nervous chill as for himself he had not discovered anything amiss but perhaps his range of vision was more limited than that of the tall scout or possibly he did not chance to be looking in the same direction where then asked step hen er, on the ground replied the other slowly and soberly is do you think it's bumpus demanded step hen also losing his color i don't know there's a little bush in the way and i can't see very well giraffe added but does it move any giraffe the horrified step hen asked don't seem to one bit all the time i've been keeping my eye on the same oh my stars step hen could not command his voice to say more he kept staring in a general direction ahead as though 
he could see what attracted the notice of the chum who had the telescopic eyes but thad was not so easily satisfied show me where you mean giraffe he said grimly if there was any unpleasant duty to be performed thad brewster could be depended on to go about it without flinching he would have made a fine soldier because discipline was so much part of his nature there follow those three trees that run as straight as a line as if some surveyor had planted the same for range finders do you see that light bunch of scrub just beyond all right look just to the left and i see it said thad quietly a dozen seconds of dreadful suspense followed then step hen who had managed to recover his lost breath broke forth with is it bumpus thad i don't believe so replied the scoutmaster steadily and it could easily be seen that he must have just been under a terrible strain what makes you say that i'm asking for information but all the same i'm awful glad to hear you make that remark giraffe observed in the first place it doesn't seem to be the color of our chum's clothes thad began and then on the other hand it's certainly too big to be him guess you hit the nail on the head there thad giraffe hastened to declare now that i look closer i reckon it is just too big maybe it's only a rock after all or an old stump suggested step hen maybe it is replied the tall scout meekly for his feelings had been so recently torn by conflicting hopes and fears that he was in no mood for argument let's push forward and see suggested allan trail seems to lead that way don't it thad mentioned when they had been moving along swiftly for a few minutes yes and we'll soon know the worst because unless i'm much mistaken the thing is lying just at the other side of them bushes they're thicker here you see and we won't be able to tell what it's doing till after we get around the same giraffe had a habit of talking at a lively pace when wishing to keep his heart from betraying his nervousness it was somewhat on the principle that a boy whistles as loud as he can when passing a country graveyard half a minute later and in a bunch the four scouts turned a flank movement around the bushes step hen and giraffe almost dropped with sheer astonishment and had to actually sustain each other no wonder when before them they saw the motionless form of a huge bear it had evidently been shot in a dozen places end of chapter nineteen chapter twenty of the boy scouts through the big timber this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Shasta, Oakland, California. The Boy Scouts Through the Big Timber by Herbert Carter. Chapter 20. Finding Out How Bumpus Did It. Well, what do you think of that? Giraffe demanded, as with his comrades he presently hurried forward to examine the dead bear. I said, bumpus could do it didn't i questioned step hen why with the great run of luck he's camping alongside now that part of ours could go into the lion and elephant country of africa and knock over more old tuskers and yellow manes than you could shake a stick at but how do you know he did this asked giraffe as a doubt assailed him tell me who else could demanded the other 
Oh, I'm not saying they did. Don't think that, Giraffe went on. But we happen to know there are a couple of men hanging around this section of the country. Meaning Hank and Pierre, of course? Yes, they're the Dodgers. Now, you see, they just might have come up here, found the bear holding Bumpus up in a tree, and took a notion to knock the old mountain bear silly, just so they could look our chum over and take all he had. Step Hen was unable to hazard a reply to this, and so he appealed to those who ought to be able to decide. How about that, Thad, Alan? Both shook their heads in the negative. Give Bumpus all the credit of downing this bear, Thad remarked. There are a lot of things that go to prove it, said Alan. Look here, and I'll show you. See, here's where he knelt to fire, first of all, and I want you to notice that a dandy tree for climbing Bumpus picked out just alongside, and when he'd rammed in both charges only to see the bear coming full tilt after him like a house afire, Bumpus swung up in the tree. Is that it, Alan? and Giraffe looked wise as he said this. Just what he did, Alan went on to say. I reckon he had a stout cord fixed on his gun, and could slip one arm through this, so that the marlin went up when he did. All right? Ain't he the cute one, though, Step Hen murdered in admiration. Well, you can see how the bear clawed the tree, continued Alan, but he wasn't able to get up. Grizzlies are poor climbers anyway, and this fellow must have been handicapped by that injured hind leg. And then Bumpus, he opened up on him, didn't he? Giraffe cried. Well, I guess that's what he did, laughed Thad. I can count twelve empty shells here under the tree. Two Bumpus used at long range, but all the rest he must have fired point blank, with the bear not more than five or ten feet away from the muzzle of his gun. How do you tell that? asked Giraffe. Why, here and here you can see the hair on the bear looks singed around the wound. That proves the gun was only a few feet away. And notice, too, boys, nearly every shot took effect either in the breast or back of the bear. The one that finished him was this in the ear. It penetrated his brain. Giraffe gave one of his whistles and then remarked, Glory! But there must have been a hot time around here, all right. I can just imagine I see Bumpus perched up in that crotch and blazing away as fast as he could load. What a circus it was, and such great luck. Why, that feller could grab the first prize in the Havana lottery if he ever wanted to go down to Cuba and take a chance. He can sure do anything. He got his bear, bless his dear heart, laughed Step Hen. Yes, and just like he did with the bobcat, only this time he hacked off the claws from all f four feet. Must mean to have em made into a war necklace, Indian fashion, observed Alan. Looks some like a slaughterhouse around here, Giraffe said. The bear bled from every wound. They told us a grizzly could stand any amount of lead and now I believe it. Why, at that close range, them buckshot in his gun just tore in like a great big fifty-eight slug. Oh, what a sight! If Davy had only been here with his snapshot box. But I can see that Hank and Pierre came right along in, observed Step Hen. 
Yes, and looked around, just like we're doing. Now, Alan remarked, I'm some surprised that they didn't capture the skin of the bear, the other went on. Bumpus couldn't take it off, because that's one thing he hasn't learned yet. But surely Hank or Pierre must be old trappers enough for that. But Alan shook his head. They looked at it and quickly decided it wasn't worth taking, he said. First place, Bumpus had hacked all the fierce claws off, and they're the best part of a grizzly belt, I'm told. Then our chum had, as you can see, just about riddled the hide, shot holes through every which way. That's probably why they didn't bother trying to take the skin off the bear. But did they keep on after Bumpus? asked Giraffe. I'm sorry to say they did, admitted Alan, who, with his customary alertness, had been looking around and taking note of things. That means we will be on the move again, Giraffe declared. Can't be getting away any too soon to suit me, Step Hen said. The things I'm sorry about are these, remarked Thad. First, it's getting along in the afternoon now, and our chances of overtaking either the men or Bumpus before darkness comes on are mighty small, I'm afraid. You see, they've got quite a few hours' advantage over us. Well, why not make a torch or so and keep moving along, even after night does set in, suggested Giraffe quickly, for his mind was always inclining toward fire in some shape or style. Now, that may not be such a bad idea at all, Giraffe, Thad promptly declared, and I'm glad you mentioned it. If we're not too leg-weary after we've eaten and rested an hour or two, we might try that scheme. If it didn't do anything else, put in Alan, it would surely cut down the big lead they've got on us, and we might be close enough when we started at dawn again to get Bumpus with the call of the Silver Fox Patrol. Better than that, even, said Thad. If we kept moving right along tonight, who knows but what we might have the luck to glimpse a campfire. Remember how we did that before, and thought to surprise our chum when it turned out the other way, and we got all the surprise from Hank and Pierre. Whose fire would this be, do you think, Bumpus or Hank's? asked Giraffe. Perhaps both was the significant reply Thad made, for unless they've changed their minds and concluded not to meddle with a tenderfoot scout who was able to kill a full-grown grizzly all by himself, I take it that before now Bumpus and the timber cruisers have joined forces. Like the lion and the lamb lying down together without the least bit of trouble, because the lamb was inside the lion, remarked Giraffe dryly. Yes, the chances are that they've bulldozed our chum and made him wait upon them like a slave, cook their meals for them, and perhaps they will tie him up in camp tonight so he won't have a chance to run away. Step had fairly gnashed his teeth while drawing this agonizing mental picture of the further troubles of Bumpus, and even those who had the most faith in the fat scout's newly aroused ability to think and take care of himself, could hardly see how the awkward lad might come out of such an encounter as this with any degree of credit. Being up against two husky and unprincipled men who had brains with which to plot and scheme was an entirely different proposition from meeting animals that acted only from instinct and 
often very unwisely but see here thad exclaimed step hen you said a while ago there were two reasons for you feeling sorry and the first was that it was getting late and we might have to camp soon what was the other why the patrol leader continued knowing that these hard characters are abroad between us and bumpus even if they haven't made a prisoner of our chum you see we're kept from doing any more shouting out loud just why asked the other dubiously it would only advertise our presence to the pair and they could lay a trap to snare us perhaps they'd make bumpus lure us on or even imitate his voice and catch us napping as it is now thad went on so far as we know they don't even suspect that we're around if we can keep them from knowing right along our job's going to be all the easier you're right thad said allan emphatically and even the other two could see the force of his reasoning there was nothing to do therefore but keep steadily along trusting to their perseverance to bring them a reward in the end none of them dared to even dream that the astonishing good luck that had followed bumpus ever since he found himself lost in the big timber would not continue with him to the end the best they could figure on was that if their chum had fallen into the hands of the two husky timber spies they would be tired enough to go into camp soon after and make the boy do all the work of getting supper and while they thus dallied dreaming of no danger the four scouts might be advancing steadily rod after rod making use of a rude torch in order to see the trail and all the while drawing nearer the crisis you don't think they'd be apt to hurt bumpus do you thad the warlike step hen asked for the third time as they continued to press on not seriously replied the scoutmaster we know they are bullies on the face of it but really cowards at heart if they hadn't been that do you suppose for one minute they would ever have bombarded us while we slept as they thought with great rocks any one of which might have broken our arms or legs and if they got hold of bumpus just because he's a scout and our friend they'd likely kick him around a lot and make him knuckle down to them but i hardly believe they'd hurt him badly but no matter what they do they got to settle with bumpus chums sooner or later end of chapter twenty chapter twenty one of the boy scouts through the big timber this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by shasta oakland california the boy scouts through the big timber by herbert carter chapter twenty one caught in a trap i'm glad right glad to hear you say that thad declared step hen yes i know how you feel the scoutmaster went on and it does you a lot of credit too for scouts should stand by each other through thick and thin but go slow step hen go slow we don't want to do any shooting if it can be avoided and then remember only pepper their legs we belong to an organization that stands for peace every time and no scout can be permitted to do any violence unless it is to actually save his own life or that of a chum oh i understand all that thad make your mind easy declared step hen jauntily 
what I'd like to do, in case those curs have kicked and pounded poor old Bumpus, would be to just give em each forty whacks on the bare back with that bull whip we used on Mike and Molly, our pack mules, when they get too stubborn for anything. Now, that ain't a bad idea, Step Hen, asserted Giraffe, nodding his head until perched on such a long neck it reminded Thad of a wooden mannequin he had seen working as an advertisement in a shop window where razors were sold. No, it's a pretty good scheme for you, Step Hen, but I can go you one better. We ought to just tar and feather such rascals, take their guns away, and ride them out of camp on a rail. The last part could be done easy enough, Step Hen declared, but that other about the tar and feathers is too silly for anything. Why is it, I'd just like to know, demanded Giraffe. It's been done hundreds of times down south, out west, and even up north. Sure, and I've no doubt it's a heap of satisfaction to them that apply the feathers. Something like the old fable, fun for the boys, but death to the frogs. But tell me, Giraffe, please, where would you get the tar up in this big timber wilderness? And how about the feathers? Got a pillow handy you can rip open? And Step Hen laughed in the face of the long scout, feeling that he had by far the best of the bargain. Oh, shucks, guess that did kinder slip my mind, grumbled Giraffe and he felt so humiliated over his defeat in the wordy war that for five full minutes he actually remained as mute as a sphinx, and it generally took a good deal to keep Giraffe silent that long. Of course, they were constantly on the lookout for any signs ahead of those whose trail they followed but they had very little hope of stumbling upon such a piece of good luck as overtaking them before night set in. According to the latest report from Allen, in whom they all felt the utmost confidence, some hours had passed, perhaps four or more, since Hank and his French-Canadian partner had made those footprints but they have been catching up on Bumpus right along, he had also announced in the same breath. If they were two hours behind at the spot where the bear was killed, they've cut that down to one at the time they passed here, and going at the same rate of speed, I should say they'd overtake our chum about a couple of miles away from this spot. Hope they made up their minds to camp right away, then, said Giraffe. I'm not saying anything, and I can keep on as long as the next one. But this right, left, which old leg is it, anyway, feels sore sometimes, and then numb-like. And I'm afraid mine's swelling just a little, Thad, ventured Step Hen. Perhaps there was some poison in that snake bite, after all and you didn't suck it all out. Don't worry, remarked the scoutmaster cheerily. Both of you are using your lame limb more than you should, that's all. But that can't be helped, because we're bound to find our chum. Yes, said Giraffe sturdily, even if it takes a leg, as they say. But suppose, now, those men do come up with Bumpus. I reckon they'll make out to be friendly hunters sent out by some of us to find him because they know a lot about the scouts step hen here jabbered like an old woman when we believed hank was the forest ranger toby smathers we'd been told to find not near so much as you did yourself giraffe remonstrated step hen that's one thing i will admit you stand in a class by yourself. Talking, yes, 
and in making of fires at any old time and place but of course they'll fool bumpus that's easy he's so confiding so free from suspicion himself and then before he knows what's happening they'll switch his gun out of his hands give him a few hard kicks and just treat him like a dog oh it fairly makes my blood boil just to think of it giraffe went on to say while he frowned and gnashed his teeth in a way that must have seriously alarmed the objects of his detestation could they have been near enough to see and hear but unfortunately it was all wasted for both hank and pierre were miles away at the time what's that yonder exclaimed thad startling the others would you believe it looks like an old stake and rider country fence left alone to go to the waste years ago allan announced after taking a look well that's a sign we're getting near some village i take it declared step hen giraffe laughed aloud when he heard this why what a goose you are step hen he remarked bluntly oh am i see any down coming along demanded the other warmly sure i do on your upper lip giraffe went on noticed it only the other day and thought then that if you keep on for a dozen years or so we'll expect you to be sportin as fine a mustache as the one old jerry william has been coaxing along this half century you know the cranford boys liken it to a baseball game because there are nine on one side and nine on the other but why was i silly when i said we might run across a village up here step hen persisted being bound to know because we were told that there wasn't such a thing within fifty miles of this same place except the little settlement where we got our pack mules the tall scout went on to say convincingly but that was a fence all right step hen avowed i heard allan say so and i guess i know a fence when i see one oh well don't talk of a fence now step hen i think if you ask fad he'll tell you some feller must have tried to hold out up here and gave it up from sheer loneliness either that or else the engines got him engines repeated step hen apparently startled sure giraffe went on for he was a great tease how about that thad and the other scout turned to the patrol leader because it had long ago become second nature with the members of the silver fox patrol to put all arguments up to him for settlement and it was really remarkable how satisfied both sides usually seemed with his decisions since they had absolute faith in thad as a just judge well i rather expect giraffe is yarning a little when he says the man may have been wiped out by the indians the scoutmaster replied laughingly fact is the chances would be some trappers come up here each season and likely spend the whole winter reaping a harvest returning in the spring with their take if we had time to look around which we haven't i reckon we'd stumble on a concealed cabin somewhere in the thickest of the timber wow must be cold all right in winter talk about your zero i guess the bottom drops out of the thermometer up here giraffe ventured to say no doubt it is cold because we're not a great distance from the border line of the british northwest provinces and then these fur takers expect that the further north you go the better the fur thad remarked that's a well-known fact added allan one trapper told me that the skin of a muskrat or a raccoon 
taken away up in Canada was worth three of the same captured down in Florida. Yes, I reckon that's so, said Giraffe. I can understand why the fur is heavier and richer. Old nature provides it according to the weather. If it's a country with hardly any winter, why, the fur is thin, and just the other way, where it's bitter cold for many months. But that fence, Step Hen went on, listen to him still harping on that fence business, jeered Giraffe. Oh, Thad went on to say, pleasantly, perhaps one year these trappers tried to stay through the summer, too, and put up a fence to keep their horses from straying and falling prey to the wild beasts. Step Hen seemed satisfied, because the explanation appeared natural. So, for a while, they kept plodding on in almost complete silence. Both lame boys limped more or less. They had noticed this, and concluded that they deserved a rest, especially since the afternoon was creeping along, and already the timber began to look a little shadowy. So he mentioned the fact to Alan, who immediately resolved to keep a bright lookout for a nice spring of cool water, alongside of which they might stop, build a little fire, and take things comfortable for a while. Luckily, this chanced to appear very shortly, although they would not say as much, being too proud to complain. Step Hen and Giraffe were secretly glad of the chance to rest. They talked valorously, however, of what great stunts they would be ready to perform after they devoured some supper and had taken things a little easy. Thad knew, however, that it would really require something of an effort to get the boys started afresh. The two hours' rest would refresh their energies, but stiffen their sore legs, more or less. Giraffe attended to the fire part of the business, as usual, and Step Hen hovered nearby, ready to assist with what little cooking they might have to do. Thad sat there, examining some rough charts he had made of the country, as he knew it, and figuring on just where the camp by the rapids, occupied by White, Davy Jones, and Smithy, might be. Alan had started to take a look around the vicinity, and it was hardly more than ten minutes when he heard calling, Hello, Thad, come here and give me a hand, will you? I'm f caught fast in a trap. End of chapter 21 Chapter 22 of The Boy Scouts Through the Big Timber this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Shasta, Oakland, California. The Boy Scouts Through the Big Timber by Herbert Carter. Chapter 22. The Cripple Business Seems to Be Contagious. Of course, these words from their comrade gave the other three Boy Scouts quite a shock. Giraffe was on his knees by the fire, and he immediately started to crane his neck, twisting his head in every direction. Step Hen, very wisely, first of all, removed the little extra coffee pot they had brought along and set it safely on the ground before scrambling to his feet. Thad was already hurrying off, not knowing what Alan meant by being in a trap. The sagacious scoutmaster made sure to carry his gun along with him, and seeing this, the other two did likewise. In that wonderful country, so close to the mountains, there was no telling what sudden necessity might arise 
for a means of defense where are you alan called thad the woods were partly in darkness it was possible to see the tree trunks but all else seemed vague this of course was partly caused by the fact of the boys having had their eyes dazzled by the glowing fire had they stood there for ten minutes until used to the semi-gloom doubtless they could have distinguished objects around them much more readily this way came alan's voice and rather close by no great hurry boys but i've tried to get out myself and i can't turn around so as to reach the spring and set it on the other foot spring echoed giraffe yes because i'm held fast in the grip of an old rusty bear trap and that must have been left here last season by the trappers said alan well what do you think about that exclaimed giraffe they were now close to where alan could be seen standing up are you hurt much alan demanded thad horrified at the idea of the other having a badly mangled leg oh it hurts some but i guess the old trap must have a pretty weak set of springs and that's why they purposely left it behind but if it didn't get a bear it caught me by the leg all right which leg demanded step hen quickly but thad spoke up before the question could be answered hadn't we better have some light here to work by alan i should say it wouldn't be a bad idea because there are two springs and they ought to be held down at the same time the victim of the trap answered how about it giraffe asked the patrol leader do you want a torch exclaimed the fire builder eagerly oh just give me a minute or so and i'll fix you out quick with that he whirled around in his tracks and started to go back toward the fire with great bounds that would have done credit to a leaping deer when those long spindly legs of giraffe got to working properly they were capable of covering ground at a tremendous rate and if he had a few stitches of pain because of that bad stone bruise giraffe paid little attention to it so engrossed was he in carrying out the order to get a torch i hope you're not hurt much alan said than solicitously as he reached the side of his chum and began feeling for the trap with both hands it isn't as comfortable as it might be admitted the other with a nervous little laugh and i guess i'll have to join the ranks of the limpers for a few days but then think how much worse it might have been thad you mean if the trap had been new instead of worn out alan yes that's it with the springs good and strong enough to hold even a big bear Phew, i guess i'm some lucky at that and then if it didn't have a lot of splendid chums close at hand to help me i might have a tough time getting out myself because you see they staked the old trap down to the ground and i just don't seem able to turn far enough to get at the second spring i warrant you've been trying all right suggested thad you just bet i have chuckled alan for five minutes or so turning and twisting you see i didn't want the rest of you to know how i'd stepped plumb into an old bear trap hidden under the dead leaves here but of course you couldn't make it thad continued watching giraffe waving a blazing brand about his head to induce it to flame up better as he left the fire and started toward the others had to own up at last admitted alan because it hurt badly every time i tried to turn around but now it will be all right for here's giraffe and his light a good torch she is too 
declared the long scout coming up just then burns just like that fat pine or light wood we had down in north carolina my what an immense trap it must pinch that leg of yours some allan get around on that side step hen ordered thad and be sure once you stand on the spring not to get off until i give you the word because if you did it will close the jaws as quick as that and perhaps do more damage reckon i understand thad said step hen starting to follow out directions and you giraffe hold the light so both of us can see continued thad there steady now all ready step hen sure then push down hard and steady there she comes allan had taken hold of the jaws of the old bear trap and no sooner did the pressure exerted by the two side springs cease than he was able to push them wide apart he immediately snatched his leg out of the trap and no sooner had he done so than he rolled over on the ground oh my stars exclaimed step hen he's hurt more'n he knows of what if he's got a broken leg wouldn't we be in a nice pickle though it isn't so bad as that boys said allan who was feeling of the calf of his leg as he lay on his back though it hurts quite some but help me up thad and we'll get to the fire by the time i've used my leg a little and you get some of that magic liniment soaked on the spot i guess i'll make out and be able to start when the rest of you do allan was full of pluck moreover he was an unusually hardy boy for he had always spent a good part of his time outdoors and there is nothing more calculated to build up a lad's system than that he limped some of course as he headed toward the fire but when allan put those firm lips of his tightly together nothing of an ordinary character at least could force him to groan or even admit that he suffered once by the fire he sat down step hen went on with his simple cooking operations while thad assisted by the ready giraffe started to look at the hurt lucky i had on my leggings remarked allan with those and my trouser leg underneath it made more or less of a bumper and then again you know traps are never made with teeth nowadays like they used to be a man told me they found that the old style lacerated the leg of the animal so much they used to lose a third of their catch for the fox or the mink or the otter would either pull and squirm till he'd amputated his leg or else gnaw it off gnaw it off ain't you romancing now allan asked giraffe not at all replied the other why that's often been done though trappers are divided in their opinion about it some think the animal deliberately gnaws its leg off ready to make the sacrifice for the sake of liberty others say that an animal naturally bites at anything that hurts it and it's while snapping at the jaws of the trap they keep on tearing at their wounded and broken leg till it gives way anyhow there are always a number of poor three-legged small animals in the woods where trapping is done i've seen a red fox that was minus a leg and i tell you right now the way he could get over the ground was a caution while allan was talking along in this fashion doling out interesting information he was rolling up the leg of his trousers though thad could see him wince a little as though it gave him pain to do so only a black and blue place on each side allan went on to say as if surprised not to discover a worse-looking wound funny how that could hurt as much as it does 
Here, let me put on the liniment, and then bind it up, remarked Thad. You'll find it cooling, and I warrant it's going to help you a lot. These black and blue bruises are always mighty painful. That's where you got the blow, and the blood's already settling there. This stuff will help to keep it moving, for there's witch hazel in it, and that, you know, is really the extract of hamamelis. How's that now? Feels better, yes, fifty per cent better, declared Allen, as the amateur scout surgeon fastened the wet bandage snugly with a couple of safety pins and started to draw down the leg of the other's trousers so the outside covering of canvas legging could be replaced. After this had all been done, Allen got up and commenced to walk around. Sort of trying out myself, you know, boys, he remarked laughingly, to hide any grimace of pain his actions might be causing. How is it? asked Thad sympathetically. Better than I expected, the other replied. Excuse me if I limp around some, boys, but I th think it'll let the liniment work better to keep it warmed up. Oh, I've got a lot to be thankful for, let me tell you. I'm not putting up any sort of kick. Well, remarked Thad with a good-natured smile, all I can say is that you fellows are working the family doctor to the limit these days. What with stone bruises, snake bites, and getting caught in bear traps, I'm making a big hole in the stock of salve and liniment I fetched along. I suppose it's going to be my turn next. Perhaps you may have to make a stretcher and carry me back to camp with a broken leg or something like that. For goodness sake, I hope not, exclaimed Allen. Just imagine the alarm of the other fellows when a procession of limpers came in sight, carrying another, and with our chum Bumpus an unknown quantity, too. What if he got lamed up, too? Wouldn't that be just the limit, chuckled Giraffe, who often saw humor where no one else did. Anyhow, spoke up Step Hen, still busy at the fire, and there was an air of satisfaction in his voice. Giraffe instantly noted, Allen belongs in my class. How's that? instantly demanded the jealous Giraffe. Well, just use your eyes, and you won't need to ask so many foolish questions. Don't you see how he limps? when he puts that old right leg down, well, it was my right one that got the snake bite. Allen and me make up the right leg brigade. You'll just have to herd by yourself, Giraffe, anyhow, till somebody else takes a notion to drop in the fire, or cut his toe with the wood axe, or something like that. Thad and Allen laughed at the comical way in which the peculiar condition of things was described by Step Hen. Well, said the scoutmaster, let's hope that won't happen. Better Giraffe should stay in a class all by himself to the end of the chapter than another fellow meet with a serious accident. We've got cripples enough. I guess this ends the run of hard luck, declared the Maine boy still keeping up his movements, although perhaps unconsciously favoring the injured leg, as any one is apt to do under similar conditions. "'Why'd you say that?' asked Giraffe. "'Oh, you know, they always say accidents come in threes, Allen replied cheerfully. "'The women folks in our house used always to believe that, anyhow.' and this makes three of us hobbling around. If we were at home now, perhaps we'd be wanting to use crutches, but up here in the woods we just grin and bear it like true scouts. Yes, Giraffe went on, guess you're right about women folks believing in a broken looking-glass standing for coming trouble, 
and all such things, though my dad used to say he had all the trouble settled on him in paying for a new mirror. But honest to goodness, fellows, I remember once when my ma, she chanced to drop some dishes and pusted too. What does she do but rocks right over to the dresser, gets out a cracked tumbler she must have been keeping for just such a time to come along, and I give you my word, I nearly took a fit when she deliberately smashed that down alongside the broken cockery, and I heard her say, says she, there, that makes three now, just as if that ended it. Supper's ready, announced Step Hen, when the laughter induced by Giraffe's little story had subsided. The coffee tasted just as good as ever. Besides, they had some venison, cooked in the hunter's primitive way, each piece having been pierced by a long splinter of wood, the other end being stuck in the ground, so that the meat was close enough to the red coals to cook without burning too much. Perhaps at home, with a white tablecloth, silver, cut glass, and all the ordinary fixings around them, some of those boys might have viewed the suspicious looks of those half-cooked pieces of meat with more or less hesitation. But appetite ruled here, and everyone declared it was just prime. And if a fellow found that his meat, while scorched on the outside, was nearly raw in the center, why, you know, all good cooks unite in saying game should always be juicy and underdone, rather than dry and overdone. Step Hen had read it in his mother's precious cookbook at home, and boldly said so. When they were done eating, they just lay around talking and resting. It was very comfortable, and neither Giraffe nor Step Hen felt in the least like making any change. But they knew that after a while, when the determined scoutmaster thought they had rested long enough, he would give the order that must once more see them limping along the trail, a band of cripples. Of course, the talk was mostly about Bumpus and what chances they had of finding him unharmed, for, despite the faith had professed to have in the extraordinarily good luck of the fat scout, there were times when even his stout heart became a prey to misgivings, and in his mind he saw poor Bumpus being badly treated by those two bullies, the timber cruisers. Latterly, Allen had been selecting several good pieces of wood calculated to burn well and serve as torches. When Thad finally gave the word, they prepared to depart. One of the splinters of wood taken from a nearby tree that must have been riven by a bolt of lightning in the recent storm was lighted. Then they saw that the campfire was carefully put out, after which Allen, bearing the torch, found a trail and started off. They kept this up for over an hour. Not one of them murmured, though no doubt their lame eggs hurt considerably. But they remembered constantly that they were scouts, and that as such their ability to stand pain was on trial. It was the secret hope in every heart, however, that very soon now they might discover signs calculated to tell them they were drawing near the end of their long pursuit of the lost tenderfoot. The others were glad, therefore, when old Eagle Eye, as Step Hen persisted in terming Giraffe, suddenly called a halt. I guess I've sighted a campfire ahead, fellers, was what he declared. End of chapter 22 Chapter 23 of The Boy Scouts Through the Big Timber 
This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Shasta, Oakland, California. The Boy Scouts Through the Big Timber by Herbert Carter. Chapter 23. The Way Blocked hurrah exclaimed step hen not in a shout but cautious like as became a scout when danger was near still he was thrilled by the information which this announcement from giraffe contained if there was a fire beyond the chances seemed pretty good that they would soon know the truth with regard to bumpus of course they kept on hoping for the best but almost anything would be preferable to this anxiety that had been gnawing so long at their hearts it had nearly worn them out allan thrust his burning torch into the ground behind a neighboring tree so that its light might no longer blind his eyes when he tried to see the fire giraffe had discovered after all of them had been directed just where to look by the exulting scout whose sharp vision had first located the far-off light it was easily decided that there could be no doubt as to its being a fire and as the trail ran about that way in a general direction of course they were perfectly safe in believing that some or all of those they had been so persistently following would be found alongside that fire the very thought gave them a delicious thrill by another hour then perhaps even less time than that they would likely know the worst and if as several of them secretly feared those two ugly brutes of timber cruisers had dared lay so much as the weight of their heavy hands in anger on bumpus or ventured to kick him around as though he were a slave well something unpleasant was going to happen to them that was positive it's a fire all right announced thad and giraffe breathed easier for he had been entertaining a slight fear lest some of his laurels be snatched away and all of a mile from here ellen remarked i wonder however you discovered it giraffe with all these big trees around there must be just a little opening ahead and you hit on that avenue oh said giraffe as if carelessly though he was undoubtedly secretly pleased with such words of commendation from one who had had such a long experience in the art of woodcraft as the main boy what's the good of having eyes unless you use them that was just dead easy for me you know now the question is what do we want to do what would seem to be our best course thad went on to say i calculate you are referring to the torch business allan remarked yes that's it replied the scoutmaster we've got to decide right now whether to keep on using it for a while longer or stamp on the same and make our way ahead the best way possible but why not keep on with the light asked step hen who was wondering whether in the darkness he might not be so dreadfully unfortunate as to step on another of those fighting snakes and have his left leg put out of commission also which would be a dreadful catastrophe indeed because there's always a chance on one of those sharp timber cruisers would see it bobbing along and would put them on their guard we had one experience in that line you know fellers when they heard us coming and got all ready to receive us i don't like ever to stamp out of fire but if you say the word thad out it goes i think on the whole remarked the patrol leader 
it would be wiser for us to do it let's locate that fire by the stars or any other old way now you can douse the glim giraffe accordingly the tall scout trampled on the partly burned torch until the very last spark had been extinguished hated to do it but orders is orders giraffe was heard to mutter listen to him would you said Steph hen scornfully he feels that way about all the fires he makes too just hates to put em out makes me think of an old aunt i have she raises chickens but never has any to eat why she says she might as soon eat a baby as a hen she'd raised and talked to and made a pet of don't catch me being so old womanish and silly now that they were in darkness it would of course make their progress slower since they had to reckon on all sorts of obstacles one thing said allan as they started out i think i can come back to this same place in the morning if we should want to find it again but what would we want to find it for step hen demanded oh i don't believe we will but it might happen you see that we'd have to take up the trail again from here allan explained you mean in case we lost the fire or didn't find bumpus with those two rascals giraffe asked that's it said the main boy well how are you a-going to find this place again step hen went on to inquire all coons look alike to me and one part of this big timber strikes me as pretty much the same as the rest especially when you see it at night time you wait and allan he'll tell you how broke in giraffe confidently he felt sure from the way allan spoke that he knew what he was saying and after seeing how cleverly the main boy had stuck to the trail when the marks were all greek to himself and step hen the tall scout had come to have a sincere admiration for allan besides just then it happened that giraffe was feeling pretty good he had received a very high compliment from the acting scoutmaster and that is usually a great victory for any ambitious scout why he almost forgot he was tired to death and that his injured leg had been paining him furiously such an effect can mind have over matter oh said allan offhand and in no particular hurry to speak because they all really needed a little breathing spell before going on it's generally dead easy to mark most any place in the timber if only you use your eyes there's nearly always some odd old stump of a tree standing around that you'd be apt to know again sometimes there happens to be a tree with a queer shape that just catches your eye once noticed it's easy to remember the same and right now you're meaning that pair of trees that have fallen forward each other till they look like they are a couple of girls going to hug spoke up giraffe quickly eager to show that those boasted eagle eyes of his had been able to see more than just the campfire ahead sure thing giraffe and i'm glad you noticed them because two heads are better than one any day allan went on to say even if one is but i won't say it step hen chuckled guess you better not snapped giraffe but now that we've decided on that little tree test of memory hadn't we better be going ahead i'm thinking of our poor chum bumpus and what he may be enduring right now yes declared thad we've rested enough and might just as well be putting our best foot forward meaning the right leg muttered giraffe you're wrong it's the left one with allan and me and majority rules in our patrol you know chuckled step hen 
Come on, boys. I've got the bearings pretty well. If that star only stays out from behind the clouds that hide the moon. Thad, upon speaking in this strain, started with Ellen alongside to give counsel and ensure progress along direct lines. Having had much more experience than the other pair of scouts, they were not only able to keep in a fairly direct line with the fire, but managed to avoid stumbling over obstacles as well. Giraffe and Step Hen proved less fortunate. Several times they stepped into holes or else tripped over vines, and each mishap was accompanied by more or less of a crash, as well as much grumbling from the unfortunate one, and perhaps chuckling from the other. This would never do in the wide world. Either they must slow up still more, so as to give the stumblers a chance to pick their way more carefully, or else those better able to move along without trouble would have to take giraffe and step hen and toe. It was decided that the latter method would be better, all things considered, and so Thad convoyed giraffe while Allan slipped a hand through the right arm of step hen. Case of the blind leading the blind, I guess, muttered the latter grimly, because we've both got a game right leg. Don't talk any more than you have to, step hen, cautioned the other. So they moved along for some time. At any rate, it seemed to go better now. The stumbles were fewer and of less consequence. And naturally, as the two who lacked experience in this sort of thing became more and more proficient, their confidence arose accordingly. Now and then they were able to discover the beacon light that was drawing them along, and in this particular the really sharp eyes of Giraffe proved of great help. Several times he was able to direct Thad's attention to the light when even the scoutmaster had failed to discover it. But all this while their progress seemed to continue in such a direct forward line that both Giraffe and Step Hen were amazed. They could not understand how it was done with all those trees and other obstacles to avoid. Some boys seem to be natural-born woodsmen. It comes easy to such to adapt themselves to circumstances and learn all sorts of new wrinkles connected with woodcraft. With others, it is a hard task, though determination to succeed is the main thing. Before that willpower, few obstacles can stand. It was while the four scouts were making fair progress through the timber in this manner that they suddenly ran up against another serious obstacle, and one that for a time threatened to upset all their calculations. Allan suddenly gave a low bark of a fox, quickly repeated twice. It brought the boys to a sudden standstill, for they recognized the signal of danger. The way was blocked. End of chapter 23 Chapter 24 of The Boy Scouts Through the Big Timber This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Anthony Jackson The Boy Scouts Through the Big Timber by Herbert Carter Chapter 24 The Little Lightning What is it? whispered Step Hen, suddenly turning cold with apprehension. No doubt the first thought that flashed through his mind was that those two unscrupulous timber cruisers must in some remarkable manner have learned of their coming again, as on the previous occasion. Perhaps Step Hen had just been thinking along these lines, and was prepared to hear a gruff voice call out to them that it was no use, and that they had better surrender. "'The way is blocked,' said Allan, also in a low, guarded voice, as the others crowded in toward him. 
In what way, Alan? asked Thad anxiously, his voice hardly louder than the soft murmuring night wind that gently shivered the leaves overhead. Look straight ahead, replied the other. It's good I happened to glimpse the fellow before we bumped into him. Goodness gracious, ejaculated Step Hen. He had, of course, done as Alan suggested, and to his surprise discovered two glowworms, or fireflies, or something similar, only they did not seem to come and go, but just burned steadily. What are they? asked Giraffe excitedly. Eyes, replied Alan. A wolf? whispered Step Hen apprehensively. More likely a panther, Thad answered back. They were all half crouching there, with nervous hands clutching their guns. That's what it is, said Alan, with decision in his voice and manner. A wolf would be too much of a coward to stay so long. And listen closely, boys. Wow, I can hear the old cat growling to himself, said Giraffe. Thad felt his comrade make a hasty little move. Then his quick ear caught the click of a gun lock. Here, none of that, Giraffe, he whispered sternly. But he might jump on us, expostulated the tall scout. How about that, Alan? asked the patrol leader, who did not like the idea of such a happening any more than Giraffe. I don't think he will if we keep back, replied Alan coolly. That is, if I know anything about the nature of the beasts, and I ought to. He objects to our being in his game preserves, that's all, and is trying to serve notice on us the best he knows how, that he's cleared the decks for action and means to fight, unless we turn around and quit. The nerve of the thing, muttered Giraffe weakly. How about going around and letting the old thing alone, suggested Step Hen. Oh, you'd find him on to that game, Alan went on to say. Chances are he'd just keep pace with us, and when we started to advance again, we'd see his yellow eyes and hear his warning growl. Shucks, and do we have to take water from a painter? demanded Giraffe, giving the dangerous animal the name by which it is generally known among all backwoodsmen and forest rangers. I say let's knock him over. Every one draw a bead on those yellow eyes, and Thad give the word to fire. We'll pepper him so well he never can know what hit him. It was Step Hen who made this warlike proposal, but Thad cautioned his comrades against any such rash action. Of course, he said, we'd be pretty sure to kill the beast. He couldn't stand for such a volley at short range, but you understand, such a fierce racket would tell everybody inside of five miles that we were around. Sure, exclaimed Step Hen, quite crushed. I forgot those thieves of timbermen. But what can we do then, Thad? pleaded Giraffe, at his wit's end to grapple with the perplexing problem. As usual, it was Thad who saw a way out. We've just got to scare him off, he said in a resolute tone. But how can we when we doesn't shout even, for fear of telling the fellers around that campfire all about us? Step Hen asked. There may be a way, Thad said, quietly, just as though he might be running things over in that clever mind of his and trying to decide whether it would pay to try the plan he had in view. Tell us, urged Giraffe. Then listen, and if any of you think it's too risky, just say so, and we'll try something else. When Thad said this, the others imagined he was about to propose an advance on the enemy from all sides. Confused by having four enemies approaching from as many quarters, perhaps the panther might think discretion the better part of valor and turn tail and run. So Giraffe and Step Hen drew in long breaths and shut their teeth together in a firm, determined way, doubtless resolving to do their duty, as scouts always should, no matter what the risk. But they were very much surprised when Thad's explanation turned out to be something of an entirely different nature. Just by chance, he went on to say, while all of them kept watching those glowing balls of yellow fire so close by, I've got with me one of those new patent little flashlights Davy has been using to take pictures with at night time. All you have to do is hold it out and pull the thing off. If that suddenly dazzled the eyes of the panther, I've got a good notion he'd move along. How about it, Alan? 
I guess you're right, Thad, chuckled the Maine boy. All the cat tribe seem to be dreadfully afraid of fire. Yes, that would sure fetch him. Neither Giraffe nor Step Hen gave utterance to a single word, one way or the other. They were, as the former would have expressed it, just tickled to death by this bright suggestion on the part of the scout leader. And doubtless, neither scout ever would believe, deep down in his admiring heart, that Thad simply chanced to have the explosive cartridge in his possession. Rather, were they positive that he must have foreseen this very difficulty and prepared for it. The only trouble is this, Thad continued, even while he handed his gun over to Step Hen, and seemed to be fumbling with both hands, as though getting the little newfangled flashlight cartridge in readiness for action. Do you think this sudden illumination will be seen at the camp yonder? And if so, what do you expect Hank and Pierre will believe? Oh, it will be seen all right, remarked Giraffe. Sure thing, put in Step Hen as though he felt it his duty to give his opinion with the rest, just to show that he grasped the situation, because those things make a fierce flare-up. But you ought to use it all the same, Thad, remarked Allen. If the men notice it at all, the chances are ten to one they'll think it was only some little lightning. Since that storm, anything goes, you know. Little lightning it is, then, returned the scoutmaster. The rest of us had better hold ourselves ready to shoot, if the beast jumps this way instead of the other, Allen suggested. You bet we will, said Giraffe. Every time, whispered Step Hen, gently lowering Thad's gun to the ground so he could handle his own better. Now, Thad knew how both of them were apt to be impulsive, and he thought it best to warn them against precipitate action. Careful, boys. The chances are you won't have to shoot. Use good judgment and don't spoil things. Keep your eyes on that spot. Are you ready? Yes, said Allen. Go ahead, Thad, whispered Giraffe. Go on, muttered Step Hen, partly holding his breath with suspense. All right, here she goes. Hardly had Thad spoken these words than there was a dazzling flash. He had been wise enough to hold the little cartridge pistol out at right angles so that the fierce white glare might not blind them, as he hoped it would do in connection with the panther. All of the boys were eagerly on the watch, and knowing just where to look, they instantly sighted the panther. The abrupt and terrific burst of intense light had produced an effect upon the startled beast, just as Thad and Allen had so confidently predicted. The boy saw a long, lithe, gray body leap wildly into the air. This was the beast that had just been disputing their right to advance further into his domain. Evidently, the cautious nature of the panther, together with his well-known fear of fire, had combined to give him a shock. For when he made that spasmodic leap into the air, it was away from the little lightning, and not toward it. For a second or two, only did that brilliant illumination continue. Thin darkness once more swallowed up the surroundings, and doubtless it was all the more dense to the eyes of the four boys because of that recent dazzling flash. They could hear a patter of feline feet among the dead leaves, but the sounds were retreating. There also came a low whimper. Allen told them later that a panther always gives utterance to such a complaining sound when he has been whipped in a fight and made to slink off, or else frightened in any way. He's gone, said Allen, reassuringly. And the chances are he won't dare to block our path again in a hurry, Thad declared. Say, that old painter must have got a shock, though, Giraffe went on. It was enough to scare anything that walks on four legs, or even two. Fact is, if I hadn't been looking for it, the giddy old thing would have given me a start. Same here, admitted Step Hen. Now that the way's clear, let's go on, boys, remarked Thad, as he took his gun away from Step Hen, and we'll hope all our troubles can be chased away as easy as that. End of chapter 24 Chapter 25 of The Boy Scouts Through the Big Timber This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. 
For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Anthony Jackson The Boy Scouts Through the Big Timber by Herbert Carter Chapter 25 Catching a Tartar and a Fat One at That They had little trouble moving along now. Somehow it seemed as though the eyes of Step Hen and Giraffe must be getting more accustomed to the way obstacles could be avoided, or else the woods had become a little more open. At any rate, they stumbled not at all now, which would seem to be a lucky thing, because all the while they were constantly drawing closer to the fire. Thad and Allen knew they had need of caution. Those two precious rogues of timber spies were roaming this region with the intention of locating patches of valuable trees near enough to a stream to be felled, and floated down by the next spring freshet. They were on government land, and their rich but unscrupulous employers had been long engaged in this form of robbery, by which the reservations lose many millions of feet of fine lumber each year. And such men, knowing that their work is evil, and that they are constantly breaking the law, suspect every stranger of being a government spy. No wonder, then, they showed dislike at the mere mention of the name of Toby Smathers, who was a forest ranger at times in the employ of the Washington authorities, and always on the lookout for the operations of timber thieves. Thad could see someone moving about. This happened when the other chanced to come between himself and the fire. "'I do believe that's our chum, Bumpus,' whispered Giraffe, eagerly, showing that he too had been watching the figure. They all used their eyes to advantage as they cautiously crept along, Presently they would have gained a point so near the fire that it would be necessary for them to change their mode of locomotion. Instead of walking, even as they were doing now, in a bent-over attitude, they must get down on all fours and creep, just as a panther would do when approaching a feeding deer which he hoped to pounce upon unawares. It was one of the most exciting and thrilling moments in the lives of Step Hen and Giraffe. Possibly they could not conceive of anything more typical of what must go hand in hand with scouting business than this creeping through the woods, and constantly drawing closer and closer to a fire, about which enemies would most likely be seated, all unaware of their presence. They felt proud of the manner in which they were accomplishing these things. It reflected great credit upon their ability as scouts. Nearer they crawled. Why, Alan was actually down on his stomach now, and he seemed to wiggle along just as they had seen an angleworm do, or a snake. Yes, and there was Thad copying the example of the expert Maine boy. It would seem to be up to Giraffe and Step Hen to do likewise. They were quick to learn, once they had a pattern to go by. And in another minute, the whole four of the scouts lay fully extended on the ground, clawing their way along as best they might satisfied to advance, even though it be inches at a time. There was no longer any doubt in connection with what might be going on just beyond. Even Giraffe and Step Hen understood it now. First of all, they saw the lost tenderfoot, and it did them great good just to feast their eyes upon the portly figure of Bumpus, after all this searching for him, day after day. Then there were Hank and Pierre, too, just as hulking and ugly as ever, or even more so. The two timber cruisers were evidently taking their ease, stretched out at full length, smoking their pipes. Something about the very air of the men would have told an observer that they were enjoying the novelty of being waited on. It was not often that Hank and Pierre knew the luxury of having a slave along, to humor their every little whim, and they were apparently bent on making the most out of the opportunity. Evidently Bumpus was aware of the fact that he might look upon himself as a servant for the time being. His dejected manner, as he sat there, gnawing at some bones they had evidently allowed him to have, after he had cooked supper and waited on his captors, seemed to tell this only too plainly. Even as the four scouts lay there and looked, they heard Hank call out gruffly, "'Come here, Yunker!' Bumpus pretended not to hear at first. Evidently, he dreaded to get too close to the men, for some reason or other. At that, Hank burst out with a string of profanity that was enough to make any respectable scout shudder. 
and when he ordered Bumpus again to come over to him, the fat boy evidently dared no longer pretend deafness. He approached the spot where the two men half sat, and Thad could see from the wary manner in which Bumpus did this that he expected rough treatment. Get me a coal out in the fire, you fat fool. My pipe's gone out again. Hank said this in the ugliest way possible. Indeed, to judge from his manner, one might even imagine it was the fault of poor Bumpus that his pipe had ceased to burn, instead of his own laziness. Bumpus forthwith stepped over to the nearby fire. As he bent over, he looked cautiously behind him once or twice, just as though the poor fellow half expected to have one of his tormentors kick him, and he did not want to have such a thing happen so that he would plunge in among the burning wood. Securing a brand that was suitable for the purpose, Bumpus advanced toward the two men. He handed this to Hank. Stand thar, ordered the bully, as Bumpus was edging away. Applying the light to his pipe, Hank sent out several puffs of smoke. Then, just as a smoker might wish to extinguish his match before throwing it away, he suddenly hurled the blazing torch after the now retreating Bumpus. That worthy tried to dodge but was either too clumsy or else Hank had made allowance for this. At any rate, the brand struck Bumpus squarely in the middle of his fat back, and while it did not set his clothes on fire, at least it forced a grunt from the scout. Hank burst out into a harsh laugh, while Pierre grinned. Then they went on talking as though regardless of the presence of the boy. Thad had felt Giraffe quiver beside him when he saw Bumpus abused and insulted in this fashion and only for Hank giving that laugh, one of the men might have heard the gritting of Giraffe's strong teeth. He was that worked up. Shh, hissed the scoutmaster, close to the other's ear, and Giraffe subsided, though he was still quivering all over from the excitement and eagerness. Yes, and anger too. If he could only have had his way right then and there, Giraffe undoubtedly would have stepped out, and covering the two rascals with his gun, threatened to shoot unless they objectively surrendered. And this time they would not get off as easily as before. After the way they had treated Bumpus, they deserved something more severe. But then Thad evidently was not quite ready to act. Perhaps he wanted to see what else Hank and his timber mate might do. Perhaps. But Giraffe concluded that it was foolish trying to figure these things out, when all he had to do in order to learn the truth was to possess his soul in patience and wait. Bumpus, true to his new scout training, even while he was listening to the laughter of his tormentor and rubbing his back where the firebrand had struck him with such a thump, turned and deliberately put his foot upon the blaze, grinding it into the earth until it was utterly extinguished. It was really one of the most surprising examples of newly acquired discipline that Thad had even seen, nor would he soon forget. Bumpus was apparently watching the two men on the sly. When he thought they were not looking, the fat scout quickly bent over near a tree. Thad had quite a thrill, for he saw that the two guns owned by the men stood against this same tree. Whatever could Bumpus be doing there? Again and again did he turn his head to glance toward Hank and Pierre, just as though he might be afraid that one of them could see him. But Hank was telling a story of some kind, evidently, for the rumble of his heavy voice seemed continuous, while Pierre lay on his back, both hands under his head, listening and smoking in a lazy fashion. Now Bumpus had quitted the vicinity of the tree and hovered on the other side of the fire. He craned his neck several times, just as though he wanted to make sure of something. Thad believed he knew what that something was. He had discovered, close alongside the burly figure of Hank, the ten-gauge Marlin double-barreled gun belonging to Bumpus. Evidently the bully had confiscated the weapon, and meant to keep it as something that might come in handy. Now Bumpus was a poor loser. He had grown to feel quite attached to that remarkable gun during the short period of his ownership, and doubtless it had become more precious in his sight after the clever way in which it had worked of late with regard to that wildcat and later on the lame grizzly that had treed Bumpus. Thad believed he had designs on that gun. Just then Hank called out again. 
Get a kettle of water at the spring, Yunker, and bring me a drink. Be quick now, or I'll skin you alive. Bumpus picked up a kettle or saucepan, the only one in sight, and of generous proportions. As Hank roared at him to dip deep and bring her full, enough for a grown man, the fat scout hastened to do so. He approached, holding the kettle with both hands. Hank half sat up to receive it, which he certainly did, full in the face. As spluttering he started to get, first to his knees, and then on his feet, Bumpus, with an agility that was remarkable in one of his stout build, snatched up his trusty marlin from the ground and hastened to put some little space between himself and the astonished timber cruisers, already jumping toward the tree where their guns stood. "'Tain't no use,' shouted Bumpus, gleefully. "'I took every cartridge out, and you bet I ain't a-going to let you shove any more in. Sit down now, or I'll open fire on you.'" End of chapter 25「twenty six of the Boy Scouts through the Big Timber. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kenneth Sergeant Gagan. Boy Scouts through the Big Timber by Herbert Carter. Chapter twenty six. Tenderfoot. Well, hardly after this. Wow, bully for Bumpus cried out Giraffe. Hold them tight, old chum. We're here to see you through, all right, shouted Stephen. Of course, there was no use of trying to hide any longer. Thad and Allen knew this, and that the time had come for them to back Bumpus up the minute they saw him open hostilities in that astounding way. All of them were on their feet now, and hurrying toward the fire, Hank and Pierre, being desperate men, might have even thought it worth while to put up some sort of resistance. But they had their talons drawn when, investigating the condition of their guns, they found that, sure enough, these were empty. While the two men lay there at their ease, never dreaming that the fat scout would have the nerve to do anything but whimper and shiver at the sound of their harsh orders, Bumpus, laying out this wonderful, clever little surprise, had amused himself by working the mechanism of their guns and extracting the last cartridge, and it was a heavy rumble of Hank's deep bass voice that helped operations along by deadening the click of the cautiously moving mechanical device belonging to the repeating rifles. Drop those guns, you two, and be quick about it, Thad gave this order, because he knew that each of the men would be apt to have a belt of extra cartridges buckled about their waist or slung over their shoulder, and to an experienced hunter it is only a question of seconds, really, when he can shove a cartridge into the firing chamber of his empty gun. Of course, Hank and Pierre hated most dreadfully to obey this order, but there was no use talking. The scouts had the upper hand, and if they knew what was good for them, they must do as they were told. In the first place, there was Bumpus, excitedly covering the first one, and then the other, and how were they to make sure but that he might even by accident have a cramp in his finger while looking along the double-barreled Marlin? Then, as if there were not enough, four other guns were bearing upon them as the new arrivals advanced in a line. It's two big odds, Yonkers, and we gives in. But Hank used a good many more words than that to express his disgust. Only the rest were not necessary. He threw his gun down angrily on the ground. Pierre was just as energetic, and both men fairly glared at their boyish captors. Stefan, lay down your gun and secure those two enemies, ordered Thad. With a wide grin decorating his freckled face, Stephen proceeded to carry out the injunction of the patrol leader, and we could easily see that the boy took the keenest delight in thus having a hand in the disarming of the enemy. Now, continued Third, search Hank for a knife, and take it away. Get his cartridge belt, too, and when you've done that, give Pierre a whirl. We'll just stand around and may be ready to plunk them chock full of light if they try to resist us. But the men were utterly disheartened. They seemed to realize that they were up against a tough proposition. Everything was going wrong, and the philosophy of your Tim Cruiser under such conditions is to appear indifferent and reckless. Perhaps they try to act very much of the same principle as an Indian would upon being put to the torture. After fully disarming the men, Thad saw to it that both of them were tied up. Hank growled fearfully. 
but the half-breed seemed to have taken the whole affair somewhat in the light of a good joke it seemed all the more strange because nearly all the half-breeds that had been told were surly by nature when this duty had been well performed thad joined the others about the fire bumpers had had his hand shaken again and again until his old arm began to feel the result bullies fell in a whole bunch barring none stephen had declared he's on his way to being made a first-class scout that's right giraffe solemnly remarked all his petty jealousy gone now that he again had hold of bumpus fat hand and found himself looking into the laughing eyes all along he acquitted himself splendidly said thad warmly and none of us ever dreamed you had it in you bumpus allan chimed in it was indeed a proud hour for bumpus forgotten were all his trials and anxieties he would easily have been willing to undertake the whole program again could he be sure of such a joyous outcome yes even to being hectored browbeaten insulted and kicked about like a dog by hank and pierre on they sat there talking of many things that must of course be exceedingly interesting when looked back upon his past performances bumpus was asked strings of questions till finally he threw up his hands to announce that the well was pumped dry then they sat about making ready to pass the remainder of the night there when another day came they could decide what to do with hank and his companion who were hardly the kind of men to set free with arms on their person and hatred in their hearts of course thad and allan made up their minds that they must between them stand guard until morning came they dare not take any chances when dealing with such desperate men as were the two trapped timber cruisers and when they saw that a uh, vidette armed with a ready gun was to keep the fire going all the while as well as watch them doubtless the men decided not to try and escape but take things as easy as possible there was no trouble morning came and found them up and doing for thad was most anxious to return to the camp near the foot of the rapids after so many days he felt sure the three boys left at the camp would be dreadfully worried ah yes there were a number of tremendous surprises in store for dave and bob and smitty when the full story of bumpus achievement was told by the glowing campfire and mostly at that by those who had followed his trail through the big timber reading the signs as they appeared and observing the remarkable progress the fat member of the silver fox patrol made once he started thinking for himself they had enough venison left for one good meal all around including the two timber cruisers thad was worried about these men he did not know what to do with them to tell the truth if he sent them away with weapons and ammunition there's always a chance that some time later the fellows might again run across them and give them trouble on the other hand it seemed rather cruel to turn them loose in the wilderness so far away from civilization and without arms by means of which they might obtain food or defend themselves in case of trouble upon putting it up to hank and pierre themselves the men quite downcast now declared that they were done cruising in that section and meant to get out of it as just as fast as their legs could carry them let us off this time yonker hank pleaded we got our lesson rubbed in good and hard i reckons even we'll have the fatty here kick me as many times as i did him though i do say how he paid it all up when he played that fine trick on us not surprising therefore that the gratified bumpus in the goodness of his heart asked thad to forgive the two men tell you what we do thad decided leave their guns here and take them into camp with us then if we decide to turn them loose they'll have to come a half a day's journey back to get the guns and so it was decided to arrange matters end of chapter twenty six according by kenneth sergeant gagan Chapter Twenty Seven of the Boy Scouts Through the Big Timber. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kenneth Sargent Gagan. The Boy Scouts Through the Big Timber by Herbert Carter. Chapter Twenty Seven. Well Earned Rest and Conclusion welcome indeed was the sight of the two familiar tents with a cheery campfire blazing in front mike and molly the two pack mules browsing nearby and the three boys who had been left in charge caught in the act of cooking dinner it was just high noon on that day when the thad led his little victoria squad out of the brush and in the sight of camp 
What an uproarious welcome awaited them, the three boys who had begun to grow heavy-hearted with the suspense from long waiting and watching, vied with each other in trying to see who could make the most noise, and give the greatest assortment of yells intended to take the place of a welcome. Why, even the astonished mules looked up and hee-hawed to the beat of the band, as Giraffe declared. And when Bob White, Smithy, and Davy Jones discovered that sure enough their comrades were fetching a pair of hulking prisoners along with them, their delight surpassed all bounds. Get into me a habit with us, fellers, declared Giraffe proudly. Why, we just can't take a little stall any more without bumping up against a pair of bad men. Who needs attention? Don't blame us. We just couldn't help it. Bumpus, bless his old heart, was looking as fine as a peach. Nothing at all like the woebegone, half-starved tenderfoot who's left the camp had expected to gaze upon him, if indeed they were lucky enough to ever see him in the flesh once more. With a beaming face he came along, his gun slung over his back by the heavy cord that had come in so handy when the grizzly chased him up a tree. And as he walked, Bumpus had both hands up to his mouth, making sounds that would do credit to any horn, and behold, the burden of the air, as the shouting scouts recognized, was low. The conquering hero comes. Sound the trumpets, beat the drums. Such a great time as they had, shaking Bumpus by the hand, pounding him on the back, and telling him again and again how lucky he ought to consider himself he had such good and loyal chums ever ready to go out and search for the unfortunate and bring them home again safely. And Bumpus never once lifted upon his voice in protestations or boastings, simply grinned through it all, and kept one eye on Thad, who finally, thinking it was time the fellows were made aware of the true state of the affairs, called out, Show you what you got, Bumpus. Imagine the great surprise, bordering on consternation, of Bob and Davy and Smithy, when the fat tenderfoot fished in his pocket and held up something. The foot of a bobcat, as sure as I live, ejaculated Davy Jones. Did you kill it, Bumpus? asked Smithy, awed by the very thought. That said so, and he knows, was what Bumpus remarked. And then, with an even wider grin, he fished down in another pocket, this time holding up some bulky articles that made the three camp guardians fairly gasp for breath. Grizzly bear claws, great Jehoshaphat's. You don't mean to say that you found a bear, Bumpus, and actually bagged him, cried Davy Jones. Did I, Thad? You saw where I left him, replied the wonderful one. You sure nailed him good and hard, Bumpus, even if it did take ten shots or more, fired into him from a tree. If anybody has a right to say he killed a bear all by himself, fair and square, Bumpus has, and here are three more truthful witnesses who will testify the same way with which Thad waved his arms around to take in Stephen, Allen, and Giraffe, all of whom put up a right hand and gravely nodded approval of his words. And even that ain't all, fellers, quoted Giraffe. What would you think if I told you Bumpus had turned the tables on these here two critters who captured him and were making him do all sorts of slave stunts to please themselves? Yes, sir, he took all the shells out of their guns and then grabbed up his own to cover them when we saw him do it all. There ain't any mistake. If you doubt me, ask Hank thar. Mechanically, the downing ones turned toward the big timber cruiser who was playing his little game of appealing to be very contrite and sorry, so as to be let off easily, made a wry face and remarked, This what Fatty did to us. He gave us up the biggest surprise of our lives, the year and me. That's the time we fooled ourselves. He caught us all, all right, and I ain't going no kicking. A coming unless so be it he wants to pay me back that way, which I don't think he'd be the case, cause he's too fine a feller to be revengeful like. I want us to take hands with you again, sir, said Bob White, the southern boy, as he pushed up to Bumpus, and right now let me take back everything I ever said about your being a poor tenderfoot. I reckon, sir, a heap of the rest of us scouts will have to sit at your feet and take a few lessons on how to do it. While cat a bear and capturing a couple of what are they, Thad? Pirates or just plain hold-up men? That's going some for even a first-class scout. Just as Bob says, we take off our hats to you, Chum Bumpus, and now while dinner is cooking, just gather around the fire and tell us the whole blooming story. Saying which, Davy led the return hero of the occasion to seat of honor, 
The story was all told all over again, both during the eating of the meal and afterwards. In fact, it took almost two hours to get most of the facts out. Then they concluded to hold the prisoners until next morning, when they would be breaking camp to head into the valleys of the Rocky Mountains, the tops of which reared themselves in great granite masses against the western sky. We'll probably have a good enough time the rest of our vacation out here, said Giraffe, later on, but you can be sure we'll never again see such a string of exciting adventures as fell to our lot, and that of Bumpus when he was hunting through the big timber for a bear, and the rest of us searching for a lost tenderfoot scout. But Giraffe was really mistaken when he ventured to make this prophecy, for it was written that the members of the Silver Fox Patrol were to meet with still another series of mishaps and adventures before they left for home. What these were, and how cleverly Thad and his chumps carried themselves under trying conditions, will be set down in the pages of the next volume in this series, now ready under the title of The Boy Scouts in the Rockies, or, or The Secret of the Hidden Silver Mine. That very evening, who should come along but Toby Smathers himself? He has been ranging through that section, really, to find out what Hank Dodge and Pierre Laporte were doing. And seeing the camp, he hastened to join the scouts, feeling a longing for human company. Thad liked the forest ranger right from the start, and was very much pleased when the others agreed to go with them as a guide during the balance of their time expected to spend in the Rockies, several weeks at least. Tony Smathers gave the two men to understand that their every movement was being watched by agents of the aroused government. The Interior Department was determined to put an end to timber stealing on a large scale by men who had grown enormously rich in the business. Hank and Pierre professed to be alarmed. When they went away in the morning to get their guns, which Thad had left ten miles off, they declared they were going to reform and either go to the mines or else emigrate to British Columbia. But, said Toby Smothers, they ain't going to do it, mark me, them critters are cut out for jailbirds, and they'll either bring up thar or else die with their boots on. Well, well, all I hope is, said Thad, as he gave Mike the pack mule a touch with the whip to start him moving, that we never cross their trail again. End of chapter 27 Recording by Kenneth Sergeant Gagan End of the Boy Scouts Through the Big Timber by Herbert Carter